Hello, everyone. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. I hope you were able to get the wiggles out in between sessions. And this is the last one of the day. We're going to make it feisty. And I hope. I'm going to say I something very <laughs> controversial so that more people will come in when they hear about that's, it. That's right. Um, Thank you so much. I'm going to have to find my note here um, for joining us for this session. Kids Media confronts the new normal. I think we're all aware of what the new normal is, what blended learning will look like post pandemic. Uh, we have an incredible panel. I'm just going to quickly point out who's who. Um, you can see some of their uh, information on the screen. We have Michael Levine from Nickelodeon. He and he, uh, I've worked with Michael um, on Noggin and you know, uh, promoting some of the work of Noggin. Vicki Katz of Rutgers University, and Ed Wells of Sesame Workshop. Now Ralph Smith from the Campaign for Grade Level Reading um, had to leave early, so um, you know it's it's really too bad because he has a lot to contribute to this panel. But, you know, at points, um, you know, we may jump in and um, we had a, an earlier discussion with Ralph about some of the points he'd like to make. We might be able to sneak those in. So I'm going to hope that my phone doesn't die. <laughs> if it is, it's a free for all. You know, just everyone start shouting questions. Hopefully my phone doesn't ring. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, I'm Kathleen Manzo. I am a longtime former journalist. I'm now in communications, but I'm going to put my journalist hat back on here. Um, and I was an ed tech reporter as well. So, um, so we're going to start with a few rapid fire questions just to introduce the topic before getting into a deeper discussion. So I'm going to hold you all to 90 seconds for the first two questions each. Um, so Michael, tell us about this title. Kids Media confronts the new normal, and um, what we mean by blended learning. Yeah, I came up with this title. I'm not sure why. It seemed like a good idea a couple of months ago. Um, kids have been, you know, at home, especially young children, have been at home, I would say, connected to media in new and different ways over the last couple of years about depending on what national survey you read, one in six or one in five have missed at least one year of you know, preschool. Many young children ages three and four never went to preschool over the last two years. So um, that has been sort of a definition of a bit of a new normal for them because it's such a high percentage of their childhood to date. Um, blended learning is a term of art that comes out of sessions like ASU GSV. It's something that we've been talking about in education technology and education circles for quite some time now, but it's not something that we've been thinking about in the early childhood sector because technology has been, you know, there, there's been an ambivalence towards it. And so I think all bets are off and all genies are out of the bottle now in terms of that ambivalence. I mean, there, there, there should still be an ambivalence about the quality of educational media and technology in children's lives. But the reason I formulated this discussion with these two wonderful colleagues and yourself, Kathleen, is that I think that we are going to establish, and I hope out of this pandemic, that there are some new norms for what the new normal is. And I believe that blended learning for young children will include educational media and technologies if the data hold on our own platform, just to finish up, we have gone from about 50% more digital consumption on Noggin. I'm not happy about that, but it is holding steady. And so, uh, you know, within this conversation, I'll talk about some of the things that we're doing to ensure that the new normal doesn't include mindless consumption, but the new normal includes a new blend of things that use the media platform as a launch pad for work within the rest of the community. So. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let the record show that Michael has already broken the rules. Of course. <laughs> By about double. Ask me a tough question. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, Ed, we're going to see how you follow rules here. <laughs> how have media companies and providers responded to this new normal, especially early in the pandemic? 
So I, I think we saw actually an incredible response. Um, you know, a lot of children's media companies, especially those uh, focused on educational media for, for children, really saw quickly that there was a need for to help kids through this pandemic um, situation that we were in. And I don't think anybody knew exactly what the need was going to be long term. Everyone knew there was a short term need. And certainly at Sesame, we, we jumped right in and started thinking about, OK, what are children dealing with right now? What is the crisis we see? What tools do they need? And we started working on creating content to help them. And, um, through those early days. But I think what's happened that's very interesting to me is that as this has waned on, and you know, we keep talking about this new normal, but I don't know that we know what the new normal is yet. We're still in a, in a you know, period of flux and trying to figure out what's gonna happen. So we, we got started quickly to address the initial needs, but we, you know, six months, eight months, 12 months in realized, wow, this is going to have a long tail. Yeah. And there are gonna be multiple types of needs that children are gonna go through over this period. And it's gonna last long after we get vaccines out there and we start, um, we start managing this pandemic. So I think um, you know, we're still seeing people respond to it, but I, I was really um, heartened, I think, by the way that uh, media in particular really got to work. And you know, one of the panelists earlier who, um, you know, we work with Kim, if she's still here, was talking about how, you know, media didn't shut down. You still had to program channels. You still had to hit production guidelines during this period. And we had to really innovate. We had to find new ways to be able to deliver that message to kids and get it produced in ways mm -hmm. we'd never produced before. Mm -hmm. You know, I can remember us for the first time saying, should we send them up? to people's homes to film <laughs> on their iPhones and, uh, you know, make sure we still are, are creating this content and getting out. So, so for me, I, I feel a little bit um, heartened, actually, by, by what we saw. Okay, that was a little bit better. <laughs> now you have the academic to show us the way. But Vicki, Vicki, everything's fair game now because... Um, so I know you agree that tech and media are part of the new normal um, for kids, even little kids. Um, how has this shifted learning for kids and families? I'll say if you're counting on the academic to keep to time, you are in a bad place. Um, <laughs> Especially 90 seconds. <laughs> we'll do our best. Um, there's no way that we go back to where we were in 2019, where if you talked about you know, media and technology use, especially for very young children, there would be a sizable number of people who wouldn't just look at you out of the corner of their eye, but fully turn their backs on you. We're not going to go back from that. But what we've done during the pandemic is both qualitative research in different parts of the country with caregivers of young children and a national survey that followed the first national survey of lower income families with preschool and school age kids in 2015, and we could compare the pandemic to that period. Things have changed, not necessarily quite as seismically as people think they have in a lot of ways, but they've changed. And as Michael was saying, we're not putting the genie back in the bottle, but I think we need to tame it. We need to think about what to do with it. Um, and you know, we've still got to think about that for a lot of kids, it's not just about the quality and the content of media that they might be engaging with, but about whether or not they can access that content mm. at all. Because the vast majority of lower income kids in this country have an internet connection and they have a device, but they're underconnected. The majority of them do not have consistent internet and they don't have high quality devices. They are dealing with inconsistent and inadequate connectivity. And especially as we rely on these things more and more, the first thing we have to do is level that access playing field. How did I do? Very good, very good. Okay, Ed, we'll try you again. Oh boy. Um, boy. So I don't know that anyone would argue that too much Sesame Street is a bad thing. Um, but even Sesame must be doing some hand-wringing about you know, what's, ha what's been happening over the past two years. Um, kids have been a captive audience and parents have kind of been desperate for you know something that's palatable for them to um, park their kids in front of. Um, is screen time still a concern or is it now just you know kind of an essential thing? 
Sure. I mean, screen time is you know something we think about. I don't think we've. We haven't said, oh, well, you know, hey, this is looking so good. We've got so many viewers. We, we don't care about this anymore. You know, this, um, kids need this content. I think we realize that balance is really critical. So it's still something we, we think about. And I think you, you know, one of the ways that we sort of deal with that is creating content across multiple different mediums and multiple different forms. This is where we get into that blended learning um, space. So, you know, obviously, Sesame Street is a TV-based program, right? So we, we created TV specials, we created more content in that space, but we also started to engage more in other tools, whether it was you know materials for parents and caregivers to use with their kids outside of watching television. So you have the co-viewing experience and then you have the experience beyond the co-viewing, beyond the, the TV screen or the computer screen. And we think that that you know, is, is a really important um, you know, way to connect with kids and, and um, not necessarily just keep them engaged with the computer screen or the mobile screen, but also engaging in real activity with their, you know, with their caregivers. Yeah, yeah, good. So, Michael, um, I know Noggin has done similar things like Sesame and like Disney and like other companies really try and create you know, a rich environment that encourages all different kinds of activities. Um, like the Big Heart Initiative, um, which I think is, uh, you know, really exciting and, you know, has a lot of um, just really great stuff for kids and families. How has your approach changed, um, you know, from the start of the pandemic when you really started to think about, like Ed said, like what do kids and families need now? Yeah, I mean, I think we have a whole new frame on screen time, all of us. So, you know, I've never really felt like the Academy of pediatrics guidance was realistic for mm -hmm. parents and mm -hmm. you know those of you which who know is it. what and well an I mean hour. you know kids <laughs> kids under two like really no screen time except for you know video chat mm -hmm. um, and kids over two it's you know a couple of hours you know a day and you know that is no longer going to be their guidance in the future I think post pandemic I think that they're moving in the direction which we are at Noggin I believe at Sesame Street where we advantage the three or the four C's that I've written about with Lisa Guernsey, which is we need to really center um, the quality of the content. We need to really understand the context in which the content is being delivered. It's very different, you know, if it's going to be a video chat versus, you know, sitting in front of, uh, you know, Minecraft for six hours. And then, you know, we, we need to consider the developmental needs of the child and you know what they're ready for. I would add the community to the, the mix here. So in adding the community to the mix, calling these the four C's for this balanced diet, I mean, Cookie Man Monster was even on a diet a few years ago. Um, you know, he, he knows that there are some certain, certain foods, certain foods okay. and you know, like, it's important that we have that as a digital media you know, equation as well. So Noggin has sort of been trying to think about, as I mentioned in my opening too long statement, um, <laughs> a cons moving away from consumption, the mm -hmm. dreaded C, and moving towards the experience of extending the learning beyond the platform. So Big Hearts and the work that we've been doing with, you know, partners like Alvin Ailey and with NASA and with, you know, Breathe for Change is all about extending the learning beyond the platform. It's a launch pad. So in Big Hearts, we've created music and movement, you know, starring, you know, folks like Chris Jackson um, uh, around sort of Hamilton for preschool and all sorts of other folks who are talking about the roots of empathy and social justice. Um, in our classes, we've been concentrating on let us get you up and moving and doing something else, School of Yum and yoga friends and you know music and movement with Alvin Ailey so those are all things that we thought about as the new blended learning environment is kids get stimulated on our platform hopefully not too long they then co-view or co-participate in the community yeah so Vicki uh, there's so much out there um, that you know parents can access often for money um, if you have a good uh, internet connection. Um, parents, this has been a lifeline for them throughout the pandemic. Parents who have to work, parents who have illness, parents who have other stresses. Um, that hasn't been easy for everyone because they don't have access either to the services or to the internet. Um, so in an, in an environment 
where, um, you know, learning relies on media. Mm -hmm. um, you know, are we at risk of widening the equity gap? I think we've got a few risks in front of us. One of them, obviously, is that um, as learning becomes more and more integrated with technology platforms, kids who can't access these things outside of school, we're no longer looking at a homework gap. We're looking at something much wider. Um, but the other thing is, you know, that media and technology was a way to get through the hardest parts of the pandemic. We have no idea what's in front of us, but, you know, the experts and people who understand things much better than me seem to agree what's be in front of us is likely better than what's behind us. What families across the socioeconomic spectrum are having to reckon with right at the moment where they're exhausted is, wow, we need to recalibrate and rebalance here. Because two-year-olds sitting in front of a screen for two hours a day is something that might have had to happen so you could finish your work, but it sure can't be what they do throughout their childhoods. And what we found in our survey is that the primary priorities and worries for parents of preschoolers and of um, elementary school age kids thinking about coming back to school full time, it was about moving and mm -hmm. it was socio-emotional, just physical activity, being with peers, learning to get along with each other, spending time with teachers. It's about the things you can't do with tech. Um, and that is not just a worry about what's happening in formal learning environments. Parents and children need to start engaging each other in ways that are not screen related too, right? It's all about this displaced, a lot of things that were lost when mm -hmm. we all had to shelter in place. As we can start getting back into the world, I think one of the orientation functions that can be so important and that Noggin's played and Sesame's played in the acute early phase of the pandemic, parents looked to Sesame, they looked to Noggin for, how do I tell my kids what on earth is happening here? Mm -hmm. How do I teach mm -hmm. my kids how to wash their hands? How do I teach them to be vigilant without being terrified, right? And companies jumped in with good materials to enable that. And we heard parents mimicking back songs and stories that they were using with their kids and grandkids to do this. And they remembered the whole thing and they were singing it with their kids and it was wonderful. We need that orientation function again and it needs to work in the way that Michael's talking about. It's not about keeping kids on screens, it's about how do you use that as a way to form in curiosity that then springboards them away from any flat screen surface. <laughs> and back into the world because they can go look at the trees and they can go wander around and see and wander and linger and not be distracted and constantly interrupted by tech. And their parents need that as much as their kids do. Yeah. There was a panel earlier, some of you may have been in here on SEL and they talked a lot about these issues. So um, social emotional learning, um, you know, we're talking about a cohort of preschoolers who have not had anywhere near a nope. quote unquote normal experience of you know getting to go and meet with their friends and caregivers and teachers and you know being in an environment where there's lots of activity and, and noise and friendship and such. Um, and we we've talked a little bit prior to this about you know just going out in the world, you can see that these kids are not quite ready for that socialization. They don't know what to do. Um, we joked when we, when we took our two and a half year old to preschool, it's like, well, it's like torture, right? He's been <laughs> home his entire life and now it's like, here you go, here's some strangers in masks, go upstairs, I can't come with you, have a good time, we'll see you in three hours, bye! It's terrible, right? And it's wow. a, a lot longer for them to settle down, but they're also not influencing each other the ways that they used to. Yeah, They're yeah. not influencing each other to learn how to potty train, for mm. example, because they're not crowding around each other to see what the other ones are doing. They're not in as close of contact as they would have been. Even the pediatrician, you know, in an Upper West Side neighborhood, so kids who've had much easier times of it, said she's watching kids blow through the kinds of milestones they've usually hit huh, right now. Huh. Giving up bottles, toilet training. How to share. How to share, yeah. yeah. I mean, unless you had <laughs> a sibling, yeah. You didn't learn unless you had a ready-made negotiation in your home, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, and I think, you know, as we, 
had the best of intentions when the media companies started responding to you know, the initial needs of these kids not being with their friends, not being with their families, not getting socialized. But we needed to reflect their reality on screen, so you started seeing every show looked like a Zoom call, right? Yeah. And we normalized it to the point where children were starting to think, this is my new normal, this is what life is going to be like. And when you take them suddenly, now the world turned on a dime again, and we said, go back to school, go to a theme park, go, you know, we just opened a theme park uh, last week here in San Diego. <laughs> I, I went to the... <laughs> But, <laughs> but it's amazing. You always see the children have these amazing reactions to the characters when they meet them in, you know, up close and personal. But I saw and talked to so many parents who said, this, my child is a COVID child. This is the first time they're seeing this. The first time they're seeing characters or they're seeing this many people or being subjected to this much stimulation. And the children looked scared. Hmm. I mean, there, were, hmm. there were children. It, you saw them over the course of the day relax and get into it. But they were so overwhelmed and so, you know, overstimulated at first that you really got this feeling that they were, they were living in this bubble and we normalized it so much that now we've got to get back to figuring out how to normalize, you know, re-entry into society. Yeah, there was something that you asked me earlier, which I, I think kind of <clears throat> extending what, you know, Ed just said. We serendipitously, hmm, a little bit of intention behind it, created a curriculum at Noggin right around June of 2020, which is called Noggin's mm. Big Hearts. Mm -hmm. And like Sesame, we were very concerned not only about um, the, the health pandemic, but the racial justice mm -hmm. you know, pandemic. Obviously, May 2020, the murder of George Floyd. So Sesame had the Coming Together initiative. We created something called Noggin's Big Hearts, which was we knew that kids needed to deal with big feelings. And so we created something that was about their, their feelings, their social identity, sort of you know, learning about themselves. But we decided that we we're gonna kind of connect it up to a larger SEL and social justice initiative, which would eventually, over a year's period, introduce them to issues about relationships with others, taking turns, empathy, perspective taking, and over time, really focus, you know, right now we're focusing a lot on healing the world, global citizenship, um, upstanding, mm -hmm. which, you know, Sesame's done some work there. So I think, yes, we are not going to replace relationships that we were just discussing, this, you know, relationship nightmare that you faced in a certain way, taking your little one to this strange place called school. He survived. Um, He's happy now. He survived. I mean, the resilience is, resilience. is there. Exactly. But I, I think that we can move us, you know, move our work a bit away from the entertainment, the productivity, to the relationship, to the family ecology. And I think that's what initiatives like the Coming Together Initiative at Sesame and the initiative that we have called Big Hearts is all about. Yeah, I mean, I think Sesame and Noggin and others have really tapped into the power that you can get from these technologies that engage kids a lot. Um, Brand equity. What's that? Brand equity. <laughs> Um, but but what's the difference between that and like having a captive audience and you know this potential that you know you're marketing to kids you're you know engaging them in kind of this endless and it was I know a spider, you all are working the Spider Man that, moment but, for us right yeah. I mean honestly um, I, I'm not announcing this publicly but we're massive growth in terms of the amount of subscribers to, to Noggin and you know, obviously the same thing at a lot of the other media companies, Disney and, and Sesame and Netflix. Um, with you know, that kind of power comes great responsibility. And I, I really feel like it is a moment for social responsibility for media companies to not you know, take advantage the, of the, obviously we're all for, I mean, you're a nonprofit, but you have a profit motive that's healthy. I think that we need to take the monies that we've been raising and, and, and reinvest them in what's good for kids. And that's what these two companies have been doing, I can well, say. We need better guardrails because the, re the, re the research that we've been doing with uh, working class and lower income families, parents trust a platform. And then they need to get their stuff done, whether it's work or chores. 
You know, so they'll leave the kid on Noggin on their iPad, or they'll leave them on Sesame's app, or they'll leave them, God help us all, on, you know, YouTube. Mm -hmm. And they go do what they're going to do. Baby shark. <laughs> That's yeah, yeah. the least of their problems, right? <laughs> and they think they've given, like, they've created a walled garden. But kids are just endlessly clicking from thing to thing, and suddenly it's two hours, and no one is you know, the, we need to move away from the presumption that parents are actively co-engaging with their kids at this point in the pandemic because we know that they're not. And so for the time that kids are on these apps, we need better guardrails. We need ways to help kids stop, especially young kids. We know how to do this. The data are obvious. The research is very clear. There's a profit motive to keep eyeballs on those screens, but this is not a market. This, is, this should not be treated as a market. And with prior iterations of technology and pre-pandemic, we had specific rules about treating kids this mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. well, it's time to reactivate those because otherwise we are filling all available time with something that needs to be put back closer to the margin so that children can develop relationships in 3D. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm struck by when you think about the history of Sesame, right? In 1969, the notion of using media to educate children, to teach them, not just entertain, but teach them, was really novel, right? Mm -hmm. And today we take it for granted. There are so many different channels, services, uh, you know, et cetera, available for children, not just entertainment-wise, but also educational channels. And we have dealt with this problem over the years. We have gotten more sophisticated about advertising to children, about thinking about screen time. It, this isn't a new issue that we're dealing with. You know, we're, we're talking about blended learning as if it's a totally new concept, but it's not. We've dealt with it already in the traditional TV space. It's just time for us to catch up now to what, you know, everything's been accelerated. Mm -hmm. The notion of digital, everyone's been talking about it, trying to get their heads around it for, you know, years now, but it accelerated so quickly over the past two years that we have to catch up to it and we have to figure out how to both regulate it, you know, through through governmental regulations, mm -hmm. watchdog regulations, but also our own, you know, Absolutely. familial, re you know, regulations in the household and regulation, you know, from caregivers. You know, good guidance, I think, is the way to and, think about and it. And parents need it. I mean, every and they're looking study for we've it. done, they are asking for they're it. They're looking for it. They're tired. They're not sure what to do. You know, and kids have gotten used to filling every available minute with, I want the iPad. I want to mm -hmm. turn on the mm -hmm. TV. How do we help parents figure what to do in that moment so that kids stop feeling like every low moment needs to be filled as mm. opposed to quiet? Mm. Go look at blocks. Go pick up something. Be bored. Just sit. Be bored. <laughs> pick up a book, heaven forbid. I mean, that's something. <laughs> How do we help make these options feel less like, you know, Broccoli, mm. presuming kids mm. like broccoli less than mine seem to. But how do we make those <laughs> options more attractive again? How do we help facilitate the sense of boredom and wonder being a good thing again when this has been the only source of stimulation that we could mm. safely offer? One of the things we could do is start talking to parents who have had to do this for much longer than the average parent has had to, which are parents who have, who have raised children in places that are not safe. Mm -hmm. I've been doing mm -hmm. research with families of color and immigrant families for 20 years at a time, in neighborhoods like South Central LA where parents got judged for keeping their kids home behind a door playing video games and they'd look at me and say, I know they're here mm -hmm. and I know they're safe. I know they're not supposed to be watching this so much. I know they shouldn't be eating these snacks while they're doing it, but they're alive mm -hmm. and that's mm -hmm. job one. And all of a sudden, parents up and down the socioeconomic spectrum got a taste of what it's like to be at the bottom of the hierarchy of needs. We could look to the parents we usually don't ask for assistance and say, how do we move forward from mm -hmm. here? How do we step into you know, a better space with this and see what help they might be able to offer parents more broadly? Yeah, I want to talk more about that in, in a minute, but... You know, one thing that we need to do on guardrails is call out um, certain bad actors. And I won't name the company, but it's Google. Um, <laughs> and, um, you know, I, I actually, you know, so, have second, learned. second, I thought you weren't going to do it. Have, <laughs> so we've done, some re, we've done some research, and actually I could make some news. But I, I, I'll just say that most of the kids 
many of them low-income kids who are on YouTube these days are in YouTube main. Mm-hmm. They're not on YouTube right, for right. kids. Uh-huh. And they're actually every single day more or less breaking the law. And what I'm concerned about, because you know, YouTube, is, YouTube main is for you know, kids, according to COPPA, you know, only who are old, older than 12, right? In our recent research, 93% of the kids under the age of eight are using mm. YouTube mm. main, not YouTube kids. Mm. So what does this imply in terms of these guardrails that we need to be thinking about and sort of the social responsibilities mm-hmm. of, our, mm-hmm. of our companies? I mean, it's time to create a walled garden to encourage the YouTubes of the world to ensure that kids are in a safer place where their quanti- quantified selves are not you know, being you know, forwarded to every advertiser in North America and beyond. So um, I think that that is one of the things that I've learned most from this last couple of years is that companies have a choice and these sort of unexamined assumptions about Mm -hmm. how everything is okay are not okay. So who do you put in charge of this? I I, I would just, (laughs) you know, it's really, it's obviously a major problem and we have all benefited during this time of having much larger audiences than we were used to, whether it's on YouTube or whether it's through, you know, um, you know, streaming services, et cetera. I would just challenge ourselves to think we cannot only require these platforms, these open platforms to regulate themselves. We have to find ways to utilize those platforms appropriately. We have to co-opt those platforms Mm -hmm. in a way to make sure we are taking advantage of all the technology, the platform, and the reach that they provide by populating it with excellent content Mm -hmm. that is you know, stimulating, competitive, educational, nurturing, and find a way to get it out there, get it seen, get it known. Um, You know, so we have a little bit of a responsibility, I think, on our our own to, because these platforms just simply are not going to do it on their own. There's no, if you're, you know, Roblox, you have no real interest in talking about the children under eight that are using your platform. You don't want to talk about it even though you know that it's happening. So how do you engage with Roblox in a way that lets them off the hook, but you get to use the platform, you, know, you provide a service to the platform and to the kids that are using it? Those are the kind of things I think we're starting it's, to think about. It's a big issue. I mean, I'm just going to say Noggin's a for-profit company. We're you know, double bottom line, but we are not going to take advertising on YouTube, period, the end. Yeah. Okay, so with just uh, under eight minutes left, and I promised Ralph that we'd, we would get to, like, is anything good happening? <laughs> 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 Since we've been kind of, uh, you know, everything that's gone wrong. Um, so all of us, I'm sure, have seen upsides to the pandemic that we didn't expect. More working from home, more flexibility. I learned how to use Zoom and Teams and every other video conferencing and digital service known to man, uh, which I would not have done unless I was forced to do it. I'm pretty good at it. Um, you know, finding is that a, other is that ways. A highlight. <laughs> I'm so proud of you. Finding <laughs> other ways to communicate. What What have been the upsides of what we've learned in the pandemic for you know keeping kids and families engaged and learning and. Parents, lower income parents of school age kids see upsides to what's happened in the last couple of years. Two thirds of them feel that they know their children better and their strengths and weaknesses as a learner better than they did. They feel like they're more up to date with what their kids are doing in school. Parents raising kids below the poverty line um, and uh, immigrant, Hispanic, and African American parents feel that they can communicate more easily with their kids' teachers mm. and that they can be more competent helpers for their kids. These are good things. These are big and important things. What we do with them now, whether we leverage those gains and make sure that those parents feel that they really have a place in the classroom going forward, we shall see. But that's a big that's a big benefit, and it's, a, it's an important silver lining. Um, so I think that's, that's one thing that I think is worth highlighting. It's a good one. I mean, I, I think it's been really interesting to watch, you know, and Michael talked a little bit about this, you know, we, we're talking about post-pandemic, but, you know. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> we're not, new, okay, new we're, stage. We're new certainly stage. not post-pandemic. Not too many masks out here. 
But during what we're calling the pandemic, there have been multiple moments that have happened. You know, the, mm -hmm. the, the conversation around racial justice and, you know, equity, you know, following George Floyd's murder really became another moment. And I think we were able to, from my perspective, certainly at Sesame, we were able, we started with COVID teaching parents how to talk about it, kids how to understand it. What is, you know, what's a virus? What's it look mm -hmm. like? How's it feel? We started working with the likes of, you know, CNN. That we had never talked to parents and never used that as a channel before. And suddenly we were having town halls and we have this captive audience that we didn't have. Mm -hmm. And we were able to take that and then use it to talk about racial justice and talk about, you know, talk about a totally different issue but within this, when, within this period of a pandemic. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, that was interesting for us to see, oh, we've got a new audience, we've got a captive audience, and kids are, you know, being sponges for what we're teaching them around COVID, we can now teach them about racial literacy, mm. right? And we're taking that at, at Sesame and we're saying, okay, let's continue to build on that. Let's keep talking to these new audiences and let's go, let's double down and create a new curriculum around racial justice mm. And, mm. and racial identity, um, which we're calling caring for, or, uh, coming together. And with that, we were then able to re-engage partners like Warner Media and PBS, who are our flagship you know, distribution partners, and say, do you wanna fund this work, right? And everyone's putting their hand up mm -hmm. now, saying mm -hmm. yes, because we see real value in the way that we're communicating. So I just think there have been lots of beats that have happened over the last two years, and we've been able to capitalize on that kind of new newfound audience um, that we keep saying is sort of, you know, those eyeballs are good and bad. So if we find those the good in there, and in this case, it's not just the kids watching, but it's also the mm -hmm. parents, I mm -hmm. think, coming in and being much more attentive. So for me, that's been really fantastic. In a, in a crisis, leadership matters. And I think you're looking at an organization that always responds um, in Sesame Workshop. Um, you know, we've been at it too. And I think the, the main thing is how to sustain that leadership mm -hmm. as we enter the new normal, um, work on the twin pandemics as we've referred to it. That work is by no means over. Yeah. Um, I've begun to work at Noggin and Paramount on the responsibilities of our sector in communicating to kids about climate change, mm -hmm. which is you know clearly a major agenda, but the adults are not getting it done that quickly. <laughs> So how do we activate the demand side and how do we activate, you know, children? So, you know, recently we partnered with the National Science Foundation to do a major forum on how to get the science into the hands of media creators. So these are the sorts of leadership, you know, ten poles that I mm -hmm. think are incumbent upon, you know, Ed and his organization and my organization and, and Disney and Netflix and others to stay the course. Mm -hmm. um, if only that, that we have actually taken this, these, these you know, related crises and continue to lead and gain the confidence of you know, parents of twos and seven-year-olds, mm -hmm. then we will have changed the world a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, I'll just say one more thing. Even for us, you, know, you mentioned that, that Sesame is a nonprofit. We, you know, even as a nonprofit, we saw the opportunity to reach out through digital platforms and made it, you know, a direct investment in being a partner with, um, with Homer, which is, you know, one of the leading digital platforms, you know, educational platforms, because we saw the need to now think beyond just television into digital and make sure we were adding value, right? So our, our investment and our partnership there is completely additive to the experience and is completely focused on an SEL experience for kids. So we're really excited about that, um, you know, that ability to, to help kids manage their, you know, learn to manage those big emotions, learn to manage, um, you know, what they're dealing with now in a totally different environment. Uh, so we have about a minute left and I was just um, thinking about, you know, this idea that, you know, shouldn't we be, you know, trying to get kids onto the playground? Shouldn't we be weaning them off these devices? Like, how are we gonna do that? We're at a conference where 5,000 people came from all over the place because they're desperate to get out and talking with people again. And um, so is there hope for, you know, as the world continues to hopefully normalize, getting kids, you know, kind of into new habits, new routines that, you know, are not screen-based? There's hope. We have to do our part to encourage 
kids to get off of our screens. I mean, we're doing all sorts of thinking about this, like, sure, characters get tired and suggest, <laughs> you know, that maybe it's time to play right now. Um, without being too heavy-handed, we do play a role in a responsibility and obviously working with educators to give them some tools to get kids up and moving and, you know, meditating and doing yoga and things of that sort that are much more, you know, physically active is super important. Parents need help too. Parents need help to be able to model putting the phone and the mm -hmm. screen down mm -hmm. and actually just engaging uninterrupted by dings and whistles with their kids again. Um, because it's been the only way to keep touch with people outside of your home for such a long time. It's not just children who need to recalibrate in a new normal. Their parents do too. And companies that engage a full family approach are going to be the ones who really manage to help families figure out a new normal. And I would just say, you know, I'm encouraged to hear people like Michael talk about really placing an emphasis on continuing the, you know, the learning experience off screen. You know, it's certainly our model. We, we have, you know, TV content, but we have, you know, our model is that we also provide services. We work with service providers to go into communities and, you know, really take that play to learn concept into communities and activate there. So it's, a, it's an area of our business that we're really looking to, um, you know, expand and scale. So we're looking for those national partnerships, if anyone's interested, um, you know, to really take that, that community outreach to scale. Great, great. Well, I want to thank the panel. And with that, uh, go play, everybody. <laughs> thank you.